Good evening and welcome to North Park University. Uh, tonight's event is one of a lot of events going on all around the world as part of Stand Up for Truth Week, which this is June 1st through June 7th. A lot of events defending whistleblowers and standing up for truth. Um, I'm Mike Lynn, and I am a board member of Chicago Area Peace Action, who's bringing you this event tonight. And we are happy to once again be on the campus of North Park University. Just about a year or so ago, we did another event here on this campus, pretty much on this same topic, civil liberties and civil rights. Before we get started, I want to turn it over to Dean Charles Peterson from North Park to welcome us all here to North Park campus. Now, welcome to North Park University again. Glad to have you back and to tonight's program sponsored by Chicago Area Peace Action. I am pleased that we can host Kappa and tonight's special guests, Jerome McDonald, Bill Binney, and Marcy Wheeler. Welcome. Before I became dean, I was a media studies professor. I was especially interested in the public interest standard and ownership and control of media corporations. I want to give a sincere thank you to our host, Jerome McDonald, for working to preserve the public interest standard and for his leadership at our public radio station, WBEZ. Thank you. I'd also like to congratulate CAN TV. Way back when Chicago was working on the concession rights for cable television in Chicago, a group of educators and other institutions got together to form the rules for winning a concession. And one of those rules was providing for CAN TV and for public access to cable television. So I'd like to congratulate CAN TV for many decades of good service to Chicago. And thank you all for coming to tonight's program. Hope to see you soon again at North Park University. And as you guess, uh, there's never an event like this without the help of many, many people. So I'll quickly tell you, first of all, if you are want to do, please use your, uh, your Twitter account and tweet out with hashtag uh, stand up for truth all one word hashtag stand up for truth that's the name of the international effort that Chicago's part of this is Chicago's piece of an international effort as Michael said we're doing at Chai Peace Action that's Chicago area peace action I am Roxanne Asaf I am their director of outreach and communications uh, also, Dr. Wheeler, Dr. Marcy Wheeler, who's here with us tonight on the stage with Bill Binney and uh, Jerome McDonald, uh, has a wonderful blog and also is exceedingly entertaining on Twitter. So you won't want to miss Empty Wheel, so go at Empty Wheel as well. Um, so, uh, North Park University Office of Dean Charles Peterson is to be thanked, you just met him, as well as the IT department and facilities, Heather Deedee and Linda Nyquist especially, uh, and Archer. Thank you, and our thanks to CAN TV for carrying this event live. If you know people that couldn't make it here today, let that person know that they can tune in right now to cable channel CAN TV 27, or watch it online at cantv.org, cantv.org. Dale Lehman, thank you for your prep work and for the audio recording of tonight's event. Uh, Travis McDermott has been very instrumental in keeping the energy going for this event to be what it is tonight. Brandon Smith, the same. He's, an, uh, he's a journalist and he's up and coming, so look for his work in the reader and in, in these times. Um, the uh, uh, Civic Lab was, is a sort of nexus, an incubator for a lot of this activity. So I want to thank Tom Tresser for making a space possible for people like Travis and Brandon and also Benjamin Sugar. And Mike Collis is also maybe in the audience. I'd like to meet you sometime. Thank you. Thanks to the group Anonymous. Thanks to everyone who helped to get the word out. Brian Sperry Art. Can we have a round of applause for the performance artists? <laughs> That's Brian Sperry and Melanie Adcock. And of course, for Stand Up For Truth, we have Norman Solomon, David Swanson. Thank you all for putting Kappa in touch with Stand Up For Truth, which was made possible by Daniel Ellsberg. 
with Exposed Facts, Freedom of the Press Foundation, International Modern Media Institute, Networkers South North, RootsAction.org, and the Institute for Public Accuracy. And without further ado, we'll turn you over to Jerome McDonnell, our local radio host extraordinaire, who will introduce you to Bill Binney and Marcy Wheeler. Thanks a lot, Roxanne. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's such a beautiful evening, and it's nice to see a full house of people who are interested in, in forsaking the beautiful evening and coming in tonight and talking about our privacy rights, really. And this is, uh, you know, like, uh, like the, we were just heard, it's an effort that's going on all across, uh, not just this country, but also internationally. This Stand Up For Truth is a, a great idea to rally people around whistleblowers and make people think about our, our privacy and our rights. And I'm glad to be a part of it. I thank Chicago Peace Action for asking me to participate. And, you know, it's a, such an auspicious day. Uh, we had the passing of the USA Freedom Bill today in the U.S. Senate. And one of the funny things I saw on the internet about this was, um, you know, a little uh, slogan thing, and it said, um, the last time the U.S. reined in its intelligence agencies, this guy was president, and it had a youthful Jimmy Carter picture there. And I thought, well, that is interesting. It, it is not every day that the United States does something to notch down what's going on with our intelligence agencies, but it did happen today on the way over. I heard Edward Snowden on the radio saying it was a historic day. Um, I think you'll find our guests are a little more sanguine about the uh, leap forward that we made today. And I want to introduce everybody to Bill Binney. Uh, Bill Binney, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of him. He had a 30-year career with the NSA. Feel free to applaud. Um, Bill Binney had this 30-year career with the NSA. He was the technical leader for intelligence when he retired, and uh, he retired largely because of the bulk data collection uh, situation, and he did not want to be a part of it. They have subverted one of the uh, data collection deals that he had created, and uh, he did not want to be a part of that, and eventually he ended up telling um, people that we had dossiers on everybody, that the, that the NSA had dossiers on everybody, which led to a whole series of revelations. And how many people have seen Laura Poitras' short film of Bill Binney on the New York Times website? It's, uh, it's only about 10 minutes long. Take a look at it sometime. Uh, it's, it's a very sharp uh, introduction into what's going on and the, the, what happens to whistleblowers, and I'm sure we'll hear, hear a piece of that tonight. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Bill Binney. Also with us is Marcy Wheeler, and Marcy Wheeler knows so much about this stuff, it will amaze you. At dinner, time, at dinner tonight, she was depressing us all with her encyclopedic knowledge of everything that goes on in the national security realm. Her blog is Empty Wheel. I'm, I hope a few of you read Empty Wheel and check it out on a, on a regular basis. Um, she writes for a whole mess of publications, had something nice about this event on Truth Out and many other uh, spots, Vox and other things. Uh, she wrote the book, How the Bush Administration Used the Media to Sell the Iraq War and Out a Spy. Thanks very much for joining us, Marcy Wheeler. Um, we thought we'd talk first a bit about what happened today in the USA Freedom Act and what kind of a, a thing this is and what kind of step forward this is from, from the Patriot Act. Um, Bill, would you like to give us kind of an overview of how meaningful the change is here or not meaningful as you see it? Uh, well, I, I, I look at that as kind of a surface change. Uh, the substance goes much deeper in many other programs. Uh, for me, it's a step in the right direction, though, but uh, underlying that is the Executive Order 12333. This is the real order under which they're doing all the content collection of U.S. In domestic communications as well as metadata. 
it's all done through the upstream programs and uh, it's, it's done without oversight at all. There's no oversight by Congress or the courts. This is all done in, independent of anybody's looking at it or monitoring it or watching anything. They collect everything on everybody on the planet through the upstream program. Uh, or at least uh, my estimate was uh, about when you, when you 80%. When you say up, upstream program, you mean what? Uh, it's the, the upstream program is a series of different labels uh, like Fairview is AT&T, uh, and that's basically the main program they're using. Uh, what they're doing is putting fiber optic taps on. We could show that slide. Uh, I have a slide here that shows all of the tapping points inside the lower 48 states of the United States. This is the Fairview program. This is how they're collecting data that's passing through the fiber network. They're, they're copying, basically they're, they're doing as Mark Klein would put, say, uh, putting a splitter on the fiber line, which duplicates the fiber line in two directions. One goes to a room where they put the, the NARIS device to sessionize that, reconstruct what's being sent on the line, and then send it back to NSA for storage. They take everything off the line, everything. Phone calls, emails, file transfers, pictures, video, everything. So, so they don't need the Section 215 of the Patriot Act to do that? They're no. going to do it? <clears throat> no, it, it, the only difference you see is uh, with the Section 215, the secret interpretation of Section 215, uh, what, they're, what they're doing is getting a more complete list of metadata of contacts. With the upstream program, I think they get perhaps 80% of what's being sent inside the United States and around the world. The rest of it is uh, filled in by the PRISM program and also by the metadata program. PRISM for content and metadata for the Section 215 secret interpretation. So that gives them a more complete uh, set of data. Um, Marcy, let's tick through a couple of the aspects of the USA Freedom Act. Um, it's purported to end the bulk collection of call records. Big victory? Um, look, it's a step forward. What it, what it does is it takes the domestically collected phone records um, and takes them out of the hands of the government. Uh, tomorrow they'll get back in the business of doing that for the next six months, but sometime in December we'll be back to the position where you can call your mom without the government picking up a record of that call. Um, my mother-in-law is in Ireland. They'll still be picking up that call today, yesterday, tomorrow, and next January because the government will continue to collect everything internationally, so any calls you make internationally, they're still watching and will be. Um, they, in addition to taking the phone records out of the government's hands, they also added some initial steps of doing things that would fix uh, the surveillance program. As an example, the FISA court, remember the rubber stamp court you guys have heard a, a bunch about? Um, the FISA court will get some bodies that hopefully will care about privacy and technology and know a little bit about uh, protecting privacy. And if they get some crazy new proposal from the, from the federal government, they're supposed to ask one of these amic amicus people to come in and play our side of the fence. So in other words, uh, we'll never get to hear what's going on in the secret court, but this person appointed by the court or by, by some other government agencies is supposed to argue our side or supposed to argue for a better technological fix than what's out there. Um, it's an initial first step. The government can still keep information that the amicus should get away from the amicus, um, but it is an, I, I kind of liken it to the initial steps to institute PCLOB, if anyone has heard of that, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which was first instituted in 2004 and only became functional literally days before the first Edward Snowden leak in 2013. So it took nine years for that to become functional. Hopefully the amicus at the FISA court will become more functional more quickly. They're also supposed to reveal any significant decisions they make, either a redacted version of their order or a summary of what they do. So this is supposed to prevent them from, um, in the future, deciding relevant means all, 
and using that, which is, which is how they got to all our phone numbers. Uh, they, they, there, there's language in this, bill, in this law, it's still in there actually, which is crazy, but I'm not in charge of Congress. Um, but they said you can get records that are relevant to an active investigation. And in secret, in 2004, the government convinced a judge to say that some significant section of internet metadata was relevant to standing terrorist investigations. And then two years later, they kind of doubled down and said, how about all the phone records in the country? So every American's phone records are now considered relevant to a terrorism investigation. So we're supposed to prevent that, or at least if, if the court makes crazy decisions like that in the future, we may get hints of that in declassified opinions. Um, in addition, I think the, the government will still be collecting bulky data. Um, they can't collect all of Verizon's records. They may be able to collect most of Western Union's records. Uh, they may be able to collect large chunks of Verizon's records, although, although communications records are supposed to be more targeted than, say, Western Union's or um, people who buy beauty supplies or pressure cookers. Um, you laugh, that's true. Um, and then what else does the bill do? The bill, um, it's supposed well, to prevent bulk collection. Uh, there's um, uh, this transparency requirements that the bill has in it. Some people are optimistic about the transparency requirements. <laughs> Um, you know what, the, there, were, there was a reasonable effort, a really hard effort by people in Congress to institute transparency requirements last year in what was a better version of this bill. But for everything that matters, they uh, excused that agency from counting. So for example, if you've heard about backdoor searches, um, so in PRISM they collect content targeted at foreigners for any variety of reasons. A big chunk of that content goes to the FBI and sits on their servers for 30 years. The FBI, without suspicion um, or any evidence of wrongdoing on your part, can then at any time in those 30 years go and look up, I want to see what Marcy Wheeler, whether Marcy Wheeler's had any interesting conversations with her mother-in-law in Ireland. And they can pull up that content and without a warrant, read that content. Um, and that's an example of the kind of thing that from the start was exempting, exempted from transparency requirements. A lot of the upstream stuff that, that Bill talked about, exempted from transparency requirements. Whether they're collecting location data, exempted from transparency requirements. Whether they're collecting all of Western Union's uh, transfers, exempted from transparency requirements. The, these new versions in the bill that passed today, are somewhat worse. They're a little bit better than what we've got. Verizon, Microsoft, Google, if they feel like telling us how much uh, they're, they're being asked to give over, they can do that in somewhat more granular level than they could yesterday. Um, so again, another step forward. The, um, frankly, some of the transparency in the bill isn't even equivalent to what ODNI has been giving us. The director, James Clapper, who's nuts, but he has already given us more information. So, so I mean, I guess the theme from Bill and I is that um, this is a victory because the government is no longer holding all of our domestic phone records. That's important. That's kind of like a, an unexploded nuclear bomb, and any time they wanted to really abuse that, they would. Um, but it's really just an initial first step and a lot of the biggest abuses, so like the backdoor searches I told you about, uh, everything done under EO 12333, which is a whole bunch of stuff also collected overseas, um, that's all untouched by this. And that's where, for those of you who are active on this, on this issue, uh, it's time to double down. And we beat Mitch McConnell today. He was very grumpy about that, the majority leader. We beat Richard Burr, who uh, years ago was warned by Diane Rourke, a whistleblower, about this program, and he said, Bill? Uh, we know that NSA is all messed up, but now's not the time to fix it. <laughs> and nine years later, Richard Burr is in charge of not fixing the intelligence community. So we beat him today, too. Um, and. Uh, both Mitch McConnell today, when he was being beaten um, on these issues, uh, was complaining. And he said very specifically, this is a win for Edward Snowden. We can't let Edward Snowden have a win. <laughs> Even 
crazier Peter King, who's another nut in the House, after the vote today said, today's Senate NSA vote is a victory for America, for freedom over ignorance, and defeat for ISIS, and defeat of Edward Snowden and Rand Paul. So somehow, almost two years to the day after exposing this program, they're finally reining it in, and this, this is now being interpreted as a defeat for Edward Snowden. Uh, aside from the, the yeah, yeah, do you want to say? Something? I was just going to add something about the McConnell. I mean, you're, you're talking about the leadership of the House and Senate. Those people are read into these programs, and they've been supporting these crimes that the Second Circuit has called crimes. So, so what they're trying to do is cover up their actions as being criminals for years. That's really what they're doing. They're all, they're all criminals. I call them all criminals too because they've been committing these crimes. They know they are crimes, and they've known it from the beginning because they've kept all of this secret from everybody. Even the Senate and the House, majority of the members, didn't know this was going on. Uh, so, so they knew from the very beginning that this was criminal. It was also unconstitutional. But they, that's why they had to give retroactive immunity to the telecoms for all the crimes they were committing. So, I mean, you know, this is nothing. They're, they're covering up their tracks is what they're doing. Now, how do you feel about the FISA courts, Bill? Because they're a secret court. They to, should be fired. <laughs> and the, the, the idea, though, is um, there's bad guys out there. We don't want to tell them that we're tapping their stuff or getting into their stuff. Well, that's why we need a secret intelligence court to, to, to rule on these things. Well, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, they have known all along that we've been monitoring phone calls and emails and everything. Uh, from the very beginning. They even knew that, I mean, one of the senators we had compromised the fact that we had Osama bin Laden's Inmarsat phone number, and we'd been following that for years. So that told us where he was and, you know, what he was doing. Basically, we had an in, uh, insight into what he was telling his people to do. So, uh, and at any point, we could have taken him out, okay, at that. And that was, we were following that from 1996 through 98. Okay, so that, and we also laid out the entire terror network worldwide. But. So uh, that, that he knew, and they all knew that, that we were doing this all along. So this is not news to them. The real news is to us here in the United States, because that Fairview program is the way they're monitoring everything we're doing. That's what they were really trying to hide. What do you say to people who look at this whole thing and say, well, this is all, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how to feel about this. The government's been collecting all this data, but they didn't do anything bad. They didn't spy on people, and they didn't uh, invade privacy or ruin people's lives. And they didn't seem to catch anybody with all this data either. They just, uh, they, all they've got is the guy from Al-Shabaab who sent money to Al-Shabaab for 6,500 bucks or something. Um, it, all this has amounted to, all this data collection has amounted to not a lot of action, not, not a lot of stuff went on. One thing um, that I think is really important for people to know about these surveillance programs, one thing the FBI has admitted to using the phone dragnet program, but they never, they never talk about when they talk about their successes, is they use it to find informants. So when you hear people talk about how important metadata is and how revealing metadata is, what they're doing is they're figuring out people who are one or two degrees away from somebody of interest, and they're using metadata to find something that may help them coerce this person to become an informant. And so if you think about the number of mosques in this country, there are something like 15,000 informants working in this country right now between the drug war and war on terror. And if you think about the number of faith communities that have been in, in, infiltrated by informants, by the FBI, a lot of them are coming right out of this dragnet program. And so uh, that's scary. That's sort of automating what they did under COINTELPRO. And, and that story doesn't get told very much at all. Uh, I, I'd only add a few things about metadata here, if I can. Uh, one is that uh, uh, Jacob Applebaum put it pretty clearly. He said the NSA looks at all the metadata, tracking people and their communications and so on, and then uh, CIA takes care of them with drones. So the, the relationship is like we, we uh, track them, you whack them. Okay, that's fundamentally, and General Hayden said publicly, we kill people with metadata. Now let me start down the list of things that have been done to people because of these programs that have not been talked about. You know when they tell you that no one's been hurt, 
about this? That's, that's just an outright lie. I mean, they used it against us, and we, had, we did absolutely nothing. They By used, us, you mean? Uh, no. the, I'm sorry. Uh, the that, that's like the, the people who actually complained about corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse at NSA to the Department of Defense Inspector General's office, which is what you're supposed to do, by the way. It's in the, it's in the regulations. It's also circulated monthly in their newsletter. It's report fraud, waste, abuse to the uh, DOD IG, and here's the phone number. So uh, that's done internally in NSA. Also, every government agency does that. D depending on which department, they just you, you have an IG to report it to. So, uh, but the IG's office gave our names to the FBI as those who complained about NSA as the prime, prime suspects then for the New York Times release, which we had absolutely nothing to do uh, with. And they already knew that, by the way. They knew that from Stellar Wind, the program for domestic spying. They had all our phone calls, all our emails. They knew we had no connection with the uh, New York Times. So this was all a ruse. It was really retribution for our complaint to the DOD IG's office because we exposed all the corruption and the fraud and the waste. And, uh, and actually what they were doing was uh, trading our security, the security of the people of the United States and the free world for money. That's really what they were doing. And they're still doing it because this bulk collection is an ever increasing amount of data they have to capture every year. It's ever increasing. That means you're committed to paying more and more every year to have that happen. And that means they're building a much bigger empire. Right now, they're planning on a 2.8 million square foot facility on Fort Meade to take up the slack from Utah when it's full. And that's about five years away. Now, yeah, and Utah is a thing that I thought was going to last like a, a hundred years of data was going to go into this gigantic facility in Utah that uh, was That so was at large. the rates a few years ago, yeah. But <laughs> now, now the rates are exploding. So no, they're planning ahead now. And the reason we know this, of course, is because any time they put up a big building like that, they have to file a, an environmental impact study. So when they do that, they expose what they're doing. So this is taking up the uh, Eisenhower golf course. I'm not sure you like that, but you know, it's taking up his golf course, 36-hole golf course in Fort Meade. So that's a 2.8, it's almost three times the size of Utah. How did Barb Mikulski let that go? Because she really cares about NSA employees and they just lost their golf course to store more data? Well, but it, it gives them much more investment in Maryland, okay? And that's their const her constituents are going to win here. That's the point. That's how they co-opt all these uh, politicians in. Uh, but, but that's planning ahead for about at least five years, as I, uh, as I estimate, so that by that time, uh, Bluffdale would be full and they will have a new storage facility to throw the new data in. Then eventually somebody might figure out how to, how to make sense of all this data. That's what they're planning or hoping for. Uh, through the White House Big Data Initiative. That's another initiative that they're saying, uh, soliciting uh, the private industry to come up with algorithms that'll go through this big data that they've collected and figure out what's important for them to look at because they can't do it. And that's why they keep failing Fort Hood, Boston, the Bo you know, the Times Square bomber, the underwear bomber, and it goes around the world. They're all, we infected everybody around the world to do the same process. So they had the Paris shooting, Copenhagen shooting, you know, all these things are happening around the world. They can't stop it because they're buried in data. So I've been calling all these failures bulk data failures. That's an unprofessional, undisciplined approach to analysis, and then and that's they, and causing them to fail. Well, you know, I mean, we've heard so much rhetoric about we're living in times where there are more threats to America than ever, and we need every tool we can Bulk data is one of them, and... Uh, but, but bulk data is not a tool. That's the problem. If, if they had a tool that worked, that would be fine. But that means when you have more threats, you need to be very disciplined, very orderly, and very professional. Then you succeed. Uh, case in point, the shooting in Texas. Uh, anonymous tipped the this police... This is at the uh, Muhammad yeah, uh, drawing anonymous, contest? But a, a person from Anonymous tipped the police in Texas two days before that that was going to happen. So they were alerting them of, a, of an impending threat. Where was our intelligence community? So they didn't say a word. Why? They're still buried in data. I mean, that's really great that you, once you find that somebody committed the crime, you can forensically go back into this mass amount of data and look at every relationship they ever had and figure out what they did. But it's after the fact. That's not the purpose of intelligence, okay? That's the purpose of policing. 
So uh, I, I uh, had a blog in Washington, put a, uh, got a note put in a blog in Washington saying, this means that we should hire Anonymous and fire the bums that we have. <laughs> We'd save $100 billion a year. Uh, Marcy, do you want to have some, uh, share some thoughts about uh, the effectiveness of all this bulk data collection? Uh, why, uh, is there, um, why do it? If, why do I go to all this trouble? Why have all these histrionics if it, uh, if it doesn't work so great? Well, I mean, I, I think Bill's already addressed this, but a big part of the, the story of Bill Binney and the other NSA whistleblowers, okay, eventually it ended up with Edward Snowden exposing everything. But it started partly from a protection of our own privacy, but partly because SAIC, a giant defense contractor, was in bed with Michael Hayden, and Michael Hayden said, there's a good solution over here that protects privacy, which is what Bill had worked on, and then there's a terrible solution that doesn't work over here that will make SAIC rich. And it, did you just tell me it's three orders of magnitude more expensive to do what SAIC got? So one of the things that's really driving all of this expansive surveillance is that people are getting rich off of it. And the people who are getting rich off of it are the ones setting the policy decisions. They're the ones paying Richard Burr and Mitch McConnell to run for Senate. And they're the ones who are the ones pushing for war. Um, and so it's this feedback loop that says more, 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 more. And they don't care necessarily if they prevent war. They care if they keep getting their bills paid. They care if they keep making profit. And so you got to take the profit out of a lot of this to have people make more sound decisions about what you really need and what. I mean, the other thing is that, that should we be doing bulk data collection on Americans, or should we stop pissing off local communities so that if somebody starts talking to terrorists among their community, they'll feel comfortable calling the FBI? They won't now because their sons are getting arrested and sent to prison forever, even if they're just trying to intervene with their sons. But uh, so instead of doing that, the government has decided to just collect data on everybody, not know how to read it, not know how to interpret it. Um, it's not helping anybody except for SAIC. Actually, it's making us more vulnerable to more attacks because they can't see anybody uh, coming, no threats coming. If you can't detect the threats, you're more vulnerable, and that's really what's happening. So we are more vulnerable now to an attack than we've ever been. Um, now, Bill, you wanted to show um, a few slides about the one of the programs that uh, the government. Yes, has. I had uh, other two two other slides. One uh, just to show you the, the, the this program is called Treasure Map, um, and the idea behind Treasure Map is uh, outlined there. It says to map, to map every device on the network every minute of every day, which means they want to be able to geolocate everybody in the network, whether you're on a fixed phone, a mobile phone, or a fixed or mobile computer, uh, wherever you are. Uh, and that means the target there is to monitor, uh, as it says, uh, it doesn't give you the number, but that in my estimate it is if you collapse down all the use of phones and emails and and and, uh, and uh, uh, banking transactions and things like that, you're really trying to monitor about four billion people. So uh, this is another reason we're failing, right? Because of this bulk acquisition of data. Uh, the, the the point, very simply here, is if you took all the countries that were collaborating, trying to work on this problem of uh, terrorism and and uh, international crime, using the data off the network, uh, you could probably assemble 20,000 of them from all the countries, the five eyes and about eight other countries. Uh, and, and if you divided four billion by 20,000, that gives each analyst about 200,000 people to watch. Now, no person could possibly do that. That's not possible. Um, and so uh, that's another basic reason that bulk data doesn't work. But they can't, of course, divide it equally. So there's a lot of double, triple, quadruple, <laughs> you know, maybe 50 people, you know, are watching each and every one of the real uh, terrorists and the rest of them are kind of spreading their effort across the other four billion people there. So, so it's not evenly distributed. So it's not, it's not really equally, so it's even greater than 200,000 per, per analyst. So that's, it's just an impossible situation. 
and they are not, this is not a disciplined professional system. I mean, these people are incompetent. The managers are generating this because it, it produces money. It takes money to do this. I mean, once you collect all the data, you have to store it somewhere. You've got to build all these storage facilities. The one on Fort Me, the 2.8 million square foot one, is going to cost probably between four and five billion dollars just to build. Not counting maintaining, hiring contractors, hiring more analysts to analyze the data that they're collecting, supposedly. You know, they're going to be able to look at stuff. Well, they'll do forensics on it, that's for sure. But they're not going to do the true intelligence job, which is to predict intentions and capabilities of potential enemies. So you can stop them. I mean, just like we should have stopped 9-11, when we didn't. Why? Because even back then we had bulk data, too much data for analysts to look at. And that's when we couldn't capture it all. Now we can capture it all. Well, that's why I started the Thin Thread program with uh, Ed Loomis. It was to be able to make data, uh, content data, as well as metadata, a manageable problem. That meant you needed a disciplined, focused attack on targets. And, and when you did that, you got a rich environment for your analysts to look at and to actually succeed at preventing things. But when you take the other part of the going, uh, take the other perspective and approach of taking bulk in just because you can, which is part of what we were responsible of doing, being able to make possible, uh, uh, that was probably a big mistake on our part. Uh, but uh, when you do that, y you just destroy every possible chance for your analysts to succeed. And that's not what they're not thinking about production and emission. They're thinking about money and building empires. That's a, very, that's, that's a very ugly path that we're going down now because that process is leading to, this is a totalitarian state process. I mean, I would quote Wolfgang Schmidt, a former uh, lieutenant colonel in the East German Stasi, when he if you reviewed the NSA data coming out from Edward Snowden, he said, gee, to us this would have been a dream come true. <laughs> he was talking for the Stasi, okay. So I refer to NSA as the new Stasi agency. Because they're doing exactly what the Stasi did, except more efficiently on a much grander scale. It's you, not just, it's not just another, East Germans. Everybody. Do you have another sign? Right, there... We have one more, yeah. Just to, just to show the layers of things about how this, uh, uh, it, this, this one will show you the different layers of uh, uh, how they're looking at putting and tracing and tracking four billion people. I think they're only succeeding about a few hundred million right now, but uh, they'll get to four billion sooner or later. It's simply a matter of indexing data. Uh, at the bottom layer is the world, and then uh, uh, on top of that is like the, uh, the fiber optic lines, the physical placement of the lines, and then the, fi and then the, the, uh, the satellites connecting and up terminals and down terminals, and then uh, you know, uh, microwave and things like that, all making up the, the public switch telephone network and the internet. And then above that are the devices that are used across that network, like your phone numbers and e IP addresses, m machine access codes, things like that. Those are the properties of the devices that you then map to the people. And so that's how you get to the individuals. Uh, that's why that theft of, uh, 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 of uh, SIM cards from the Dutch firm of up to two billion SIM cards gives them not only the, the, it's, that's your, your subscriber identification module, it carries with it your identification and your uh, keys for accessing your device, which means through the network they can download anything they want to your device and make it do anything they want, which means they own your device. That now becomes a monitoring system for you, a tracking and monitoring system. Here you are, this is what you're saying, this is what you're doing. So that's a way of collecting even more data uh, on the scale of billions per. Uh, Bill, one bi way I've thought about Treasure Map is to me, to one level, it makes sense to me because it's the military, and the military needs to have the best maps of the battlefield. Is that right? Yes. But then you think about that, and that means we're the battlefield. Yeah. You and your smartphone are the battlefield. Right. Uh, we are now the enemy, or the potential enemy. I mean, they, they look at us as potentially uh, relevant to the, t to the war. Uh, uh, what war was that? Uh, when did Congress declare war? They never did. The president did. That's not constitutionally uh, allowed. Now, what happened to the NSA be, that you joined? I mean, you joined it, uh, um, you know, four decades ago or so, and it was 
a little code breaking thing that uh, snooped on the Soviet Union, your, your diligent little desk people. I don't know how to describe it. Nobody even knew what the NSA was or what it did. What kind of place was this when you went to work every day? You went to work every day for 30 years there. Well, we, we referred to it as no such agency because even Congress members didn't even know we existed. I mean, uh, Jim Bamford was talking to, uh, to one of the members of Congress one uh, in, in the early 80s when he was writing his first book about NSA, and he, sa he said uh, something to the effect of, well, what are, you, what, what are you doing with NSA? And the, and the uh, congressman said, uh, what's that? Because he didn't even know it existed. It was created by a, another executive order by President Truman, not by law. Congress didn't know about it. It's not covered under, n it's not audited by the General Accounting Office. Uh, there's no auditing. It's like, wouldn't you like to have a job where somebody's going to give you $10 billion a year and say, go spend this any way you want? You don't have to be accounted for? I mean, you don't have to account for any of it? Well, that's, the, that's what's happening there. That's a setup for corruption. I mean, and CIA is the same. They're not audited either. We should audit these agencies. And they say, well, they don't have anybody cleared. Well, it's easy to clear auditors just like they clear people to work at NSA, they can clear auditors and bring them in and do the audits. That's not a problem, but they want these secret agencies. See, that's why governments, when they create these secret agencies, they can't really trust them. It's true now, the Bundestag in Germany is now finding out what the B&D has been spying on and, and passing data about German citizens to the NSA for, for analysis as well. Oh. I you mean, this is against you, German law. You stayed there for three decades. Was it doing a good job at uh, uh, busting <coughs> codes and having a, you know, okay, going at the Soviet sure. Union? Why, why shouldn't we have hated you uh, for, yeah. 30, for 30 years, Bill? Uh, I was there because I was having a lot of fun breaking codes and ciphers and things like that and data systems, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but it was also against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. It was not, which we're posing at that time, this was the Cold War, posing a threat. So I was one of the main guys, one of them anyway, on warning for nuclear threat and, and, uh, and conflict with the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. So that was my job at NSA. I had a lot of fun doing it. It was, it was actually, I felt like I was doing the proper job, trying to defend this country against potential enemies. That's what intelligence is supposed to do. Not spy on your own citizens. Uh, That's not the job of intelligence. Was it effective then? Do you feel like you were breaking codes and doing it, something uh, valuable? Yes, but I can't tell you what it, how well I did it. <laughs> so yes. OK, That's I right. just wanted to make sure it was a little more effective than it sounds like it is today. Um, well, OK, what happened? Why did, how did it turn? Well, you see, OK, I, this is the way I figured it. OK, I, when I, what I could see of in, internally in NSA, when the wall f fell and the Soviet Union disintegrated in eight, 1989, Okay, they were sitting there, and here we had this vast empire of intelligence, right? And so who's going to be our new uh, Cold War part, uh, partner in, in the sense of having some opposition to target? SAIC can't get rich if there's no enemy. Exactly. And you can't get all these contracts, not just SAIC, there's like 15 of them, but uh, SAIC was one of the, they had the in track, inside track for that. But uh, so we had to have a new, a new uh, a target, a new um, uh, enemy to go after. And I said, well, here's all the, this activity in the internet. The digital age is exploding. We're going blind. We better deal with this digital age. So we have to have, this is our new target. Okay, so now it's gonna take a lot of money and it will justify the existence on the scale that we are. Uh, there's about 30, 35,000 people, something like that, plus worldwide installations and things that uh, needed to be sustained and contracts and things like that, that we had to keep going. So um, when, when our true enemy went away with the Cold War, we, we, we had to find a new one, and that became the digital age, the digital communications networks. How does a guy like Michael Hayden get to be head of uh, the NSA? What, what's his, what was his game? What's a guy like that in, in for? I, I really can't answer that. He was a history major, as far as I know. Uh, so, you know. That doesn't compute for me. I'm a mathematician. I was supposed to do these crypt things and stuff like that. That was my bag. I, I didn't know what his bag was. It wasn't certainly breaking but it, codes. But it's important to remember that my, so Michael Hayden oversaw this, this big expansion. Um, he, he really privatized a lot of what, what NSA was doing. And then he moved to the new director of national intelligence for a little while. And then he moved to the CIA. And at each step of the process, he prevented basically Dick Cheney 
from being discovered as a criminal. Um, but not just Dick Cheney. I mean, so he agreed to do what David Addington asked with the illegal wiretap program. And then when he moved to ODNI, he started protecting that. When he moved, and he was specifically selected to move to CIA because he was going to protect the torture program. Um, and so the, one of the, um, he, torture was still going on when he became uh, director of CIA, but especially he lied about, I mean, he's very good at lying. There's a great part of this, the, the torture report, and an almost <clears throat> entire chapter dedicated to Michael Hayden about his lies. Um, so, I mean, one reason maybe that he got to be in charge of the NSA is because he's very uh, persistent, although not persuasive, in lying. Uh, loyal. He also, he also, while he was at CIA, that's when they uh, destroyed the uh, tapes of the uh, torturing. So he destroyed that evidence. Uh, and, and I mean, he's on all, uh, TV all the time, talking about this stuff. Yeah, people beat up on Edward Snowden, but Michael Hayden and James Clapper are still invited in polite company. Explain that to me. Um, did, did you want to say something about Mr. Alexander as well? <laughs> he's invited in play company too, and he's also getting even richer. He's, he's decided the banks have all the money, so he has spent the years since he retired uh, suckering the banks to give over his money to, to go uh, strike out at people. I, did want to tell, I do want to tell this story, because actually it's a really neat story to bring back to whistleblowers. Um, in, because because the Stand Up for Truth is sort of an effort to talk about how important whistleblowers are and an effort to make it, uh, to, to bro broaden it across boundaries. I think the Edward Snowden story makes it clear why that's necessary. Um, James Bamford, who we've talked about a couple times, sort of the NSA historian, but himself was a whistleblower at NSA way back for the church. He went and testified secretly to the church community and then went and um, explained to everyone who this no such agency was. And then in 2012, Bill did an interview with James Bamford to explain to him what the Utah Data Center was going to be. And he said that they were collecting these dossiers on people. Now, do you want to explain what the dossiers really well, are? It's like uh, if you put together everything you do electronically, and then uh, including all the text that you send, and, and even the audio or translations, rough translations of the audio by machine, uh, uh, on the f millions of phone calls of U.S. citizens and then, or anybody on the planet, really, then it's a matter simply of indexing that data and putting it at a timeline to show all of your transactions and how, throughout your life for any period of time that they have data on. So that's basically a dossier. So Bill explained the dossiers reported in this article for James Bamford back in 2012. Not very long afterward, director of National Security Agency, uh, Keith Alexander, goes to DEF CON, which is a hacker conference, and rather than wearing his general's uniform, he dressed up as a hacker. He wore jeans and t-shirt and looked absolutely absurd. And at the end, as part of Q&A, he was asked by the, by the guy who organized the conference, tell us about these dossiers. Bill Binney said that you guys are collecting dossiers on everybody. Is that true? And Keith Alexander said, no, 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 we would never do anything like that, and the claim is false and it's wrong. So in July of 2012, Keith Alexander said, in response, trying to rebut Bill Binney, we don't collect data on millions of Americans. And Ron Wyden saw that, and he spent eight months over the next, trying to get Keith Alexander or his boss James Clapper to correct that lie and to, to correct the misimpression that he left publicly that the, that the NSA does not collect data on millions of Americans. And that's what led to the March 2013 question, the famous question, which th this is the backstory to that famous question, do you collect data on millions of Americans? And James Clapper said, not wittingly. And in Hawaii, Edward Snowden was watching both of those events and went nuts. And he said, can you believe this bullshit? Uh, I'm I am quoting him from another James Bamford article, by the way. Um, and that was, the, that was his final straw, was, was seeing um, this series of whistleblowers, but also seeing these public lies, which, uh, you know, eight months of effort would not get either James Clapper or Keith Alexander to back off their public lies to the American people. And that's what brought down the torrent. That's, what, that's, that's one of the final straws that, that led Edward Snowden to leak all those documents. 
Yeah, there was, there was another question that was much more interesting, I think. It showed the, the arrogance of these uh, intelligence agencies in the U.S. government and the arrogance and contempt they had for the U.S. government. It came when uh, uh, Senator Wyden asked uh, Alexander again, how many U.S. citizens do you have in your databases? This is one he can't avoid. He can't use wording games to say the people or anything. So uh, he said, well, I'll have to go back and answer it to you. And they, they answered him in writing. And what they said is, we can't tell you that because it would be a violation of the privacy rights of U.S. citizens. And the real reason they answered it that way is because they had already been told by the rubber stamp FISA court that if you collect data on Americans but don't know that you've collected the data on Americans, then it's not illegal. But if you know that you've collected the data on Americans, so if you actually have to count it someday and know, then it all of a sudden becomes illegal and you've broken the law. And that's the rule that the uh, secret rubber stamp FISA court gave, and that's yeah. why we can't count and, how many men. And for them to be able to count that would have been a very simple little routine to count how many phone numbers do I have in my database that start with the number one? That's zone one of the world, that's the U.S. and Canada. Okay, I can eliminate the subgroup it by area code and get rid of the Canadians. Then a number left is, I have the, so many unique numbers, that, that's how many Americans I have. Then all I have to do is, how, how many times do I have each of them in there? My estimate was each number's in there between several hundred to several thousand times. And that was a few years ago. Now it's up thousands of times more. So. The point is that was easy to count if you just wrote a little software routine and looked for IPs and things like that, blocks of IPs that were allocated to the ISPs in the United States to own one of the world for that, for that too. So, I mean, that would have been easy to handle and easy to answer, but they chose a different path. They chose the path of showing arrogance for the entire government of the United States. That's what the intelligence agencies are now. They're basically running things more than anybody else. You know, I've been interested in looking at the coverage of this USA Freedom thing and trying to decide where the mainstream head is at. If you get the New York Times and you read today's uh, front page, it seems to think that, well, we've got to put up with some amount of surveillance. There's going to be some surveillance that goes on. We're going to have to make a trade-off for security. Um, mass bulk data collection by the government may be a stretch too far, but we know they're going to look through it, and we've got, and I mean, this is like the whole tone of the debate around the USA Freedom thing, and it took us 15 years to have this little discussion about the USA Freedom thing, <laughs> and, and now the, the, the idea is um, we're just going to kind of settle for some collection of surveillance and intelligence that isn't like it used to be because we need our security on the other hand. And, and this USA Freedom thing is, is the thing that cut, cut right down the middle and is, is the compromise we make. One of the real secrets of the USA Freedom Act, um, and this does not make me popular among a lot of activists, but there, um, largely because Verizon stopped collecting the records in the way the NSA wanted it, they weren't getting all the data they wanted. It, they'll still get everything they want from AT&T and then some, but they weren't getting everything they wanted from Verizon. So they already, and then in 2009, when they discovered that the NSA was breaking the FISA's rules and running this program like it was foreign data, not domestic data, they had to shut a bunch of stuff down. So that happened in 2009 because of technology, Verizon isn't giving them as much as they want. So the program wasn't functioning the way they wanted to. And they had been talking for a number of years about trying to fix it, and one of the fixes was to go to the providers because then Verizon has all the data, right? And, um, and so one of the little secrets about the USA Freedom Act is the intelligence community wanted it. A big parts of the intelligence community said, this is a solution to a problem that we have had, and we will pursue it, and guess what? We're gonna get great PR by making everyone think that we listen to Edward Snowden. Um, uh, there, was a, there's a, there was actually an article on this, uh, to this effect uh, from Shane Harris, who I think now works for the Daily Beast, I forget, he keeps moving around. But uh, he quoted somebody as saying, this is a nothing, nothing burger, the USA Freedom Act for privacy activists. And the real reason they say that again, and maybe, I guess I'll, this will be my last comment, 
until we go to questions, is the real reason they say that is because the things that they really care about, like backdoor searches on Americans that they don't want to count because they don't ever want to be held accountable for them, like the, the far, far, far greater volumes of data that they collect under the executive order EO-12333, um, that stuff is untouched. And so they feel like they've come out of this relatively unscathed. Uh, I, 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 uh, I just thought that uh, the, the bulk approach is, is the unprofessional approach. They're still advocating the unprofessional approach. It's not a discipline that they're using. So they're not going to succeed. It doesn't matter what they try to do unless they start to be professional about this and competent, not incompetent, like they are now. Uh, if they don't start focusing and doing and, and moving in that direction, they're not going to protect anybody. We're spending all this money for a forensics policing operation with our intelligence communities. That's, that's what's happening. Are you worried that the public is going to settle for this kind of a compromise that, well, we did something, we rolled back something, we've got to strike a balance between surveillance and, and uh, security? Uh, I, I, ho I certainly hope not. I would just like to say that I think they should simply obey the Constitution. If you do that, that's pretty simple. Um, for, to me, this is not difficult, right? It's, it's pretty simple. If you're going to carry, if you want data about a U.S. citizen in your database, it should conform to the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. State the name of the person, give the probable cause for doing it, where you're going to search, and what, what data you're after, and what you're going to keep. That's pretty simple. That's a standard for that, that we had to oppose General Ritz by George III. And instead of George III, we got George the W. Right? So now we're back to General Ritz, right? That's, I mean, I could not understand how a, how a judge uh, in any court could issue a General Ritz. I mean, for God's sake, he's got to know what the Fourth Amendment says. He's a lawyer, first of all, and then a judge. He should know. He's supposed to use that as a way of adjudicating contests in Article Three courts, right? Arguing back and forth. He's supposed to use the law and the Constitution. So he's got to know that. Now, so how can these judges sign this warrant? I don't, I don't know how they can do it. That's why I say they should all be fired. <laughs> it sounds like you... <laughs> You think the courts have to rescue us because it's not going to be the politicians and it's not going to yeah. be the agencies or anybody in the Well, the I think the, our, the Second Circuit of the Court of Appeals that took, a, took the right step here. It's the first time we actually got this case into an Article Three court. The FISA court is not an Article Three court. I call it an Article Two court because it works for the administration on the sixth floor of the DOJ building. And it only hears the government side. Never hears any other. There's no other argument against. There's nothing to decide. You just rubber stamp what they tell you. So I, 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 the Article Three courts are the where where we have to take this. That's that's why the that's why uh, I wrote an affidavit uh, in support of Jewell versus NSA, challenging the constitutional right of NSA to to collect all this data to begin with, to even have it in their databases. Um, and that, that, that was a sworn, they could have called me into court, I'm, this is a sworn affidavit, I'm liable for everything I said, okay? And I said they're copying everything, so, so uh, my point is uh, pretty simple, that they need to get back to doing a professional job, they're not doing that now, and they haven't been doing it since 9-11. And it's all been about money since then. Well, let's take a few questions, and let's have a big hand for uh, Marcy Wheeler and... Uh, Bill Binney. Um, sir, if you wanted to step up to the microphone there and give a holler into it, um, we'd be able to hear you. It's not working. I, I think it's on. Uh, with all due respect, I would like to take issue with Mr. Binney's uh, statement about the, especially about the, uh, that the, the bulk data collection is not, effect, is not the way to go and is not effective. Because Mr. Binney assumes that uh, somehow this is done for, to counter terrorism. And 
all in the, by all indications, we should have, by now, came, come to the conclusion that's not for to counter terrorism. This data, bulk data collection, multi-billion dollar uh, racket is for something else, and okay. that's something else. At, as anybody who is sane can, can tell, is about intimidation, bribery, threatening, and blackmail of everybody who is somebody, or who will be somebody, whether it's a politician, as a journalist, as somebody in the Nobel Peace Prize, if it's a, if it's a head of state, anybody who could have anything that could use, so they keep that data, they collect it, and they store it. Okay. When comes the issue to use it, they use it against what they want to get. This is an empire. We have to run an empire internationally. That's right. what they do. All right, I think we get where you're coming from. I don't know if that was a question or not. I don't know. Um, come on up. The, the, I do want to, uh, there's a really important point about that. Um, even today in Congress, this debate was portrayed as something entirely just about counterterrorism. But a lot, I mean, the, the phone dragnet, at least on paper, is still supposed to be limited to counterterrorism. But, uh, for example, roving wiretaps, the other uses of Section 215 can be used against hackers, can be used against leakers, can be used against perceived spies from other countries. Um, the roving wiretap can be used for other purposes. And the stuff collected overseas can be used for anything. So remember that when they want to turn it into a story about counterterrorism, that, 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 they're, that the uses are far broader. It can be used against Dilma Rousseff and Angela Merkel, and they are terrorists. Sir, sir uh, in front of the microphone. Uh, uh, hi, Marcy. Um, I have a question, just, uh, just what you had mentioned earlier about like uh, 215. So after the Patriot Act passed, we know that they vastly expanded pen register orders and how those work. Maybe you could give us a little bit of background about how the government actually uses that versus like how it was intended to be used after the Patriot Act passed. Wait, so I, I'm not sure I heard your question. Okay, so the question is can, so after Patriot Act passed, um, we've vastly expanded uh, pen register orders. Like, so can you talk a little bit about how the government uses those orders? You're trying to get me to say that they're, they're collecting uh, location data with pen register, um, I'm <laughs> getting some more information. No, so um, pen register is another authority that's under Patriot Act that wasn't uh, sunsetted this time. And one of the things, I, I learned a lot in covering the USA Freedom Act fight because when they were doing transparency procedures, as I said, the stuff that they want to hide is the stuff they didn't count. And they did not count any kind of location data. Um, and so the pen register, they do something like 300 pen registers a year. Pen registers are supposed, they, they used to be in the old days call records. For some reason they collect call records on the business record provision and location on the call records provision. Um, and there are technical reasons why they're doing that, but there, there is a, there, um, we know that they use pen registers under FISA to collect location until 2006. They were using it um, kind of as a gimme, and then there is very good reason because they're doing it in the criminal context when they bother to get any kind of uh, warrant or order at all. Um, we should believe they're doing it in the FISA world as well, but in the FISA world, these things tend to be more programmatic. So I would not at all be surprised if we learn down the road that they've got things like stingrays, which is why I think he asked the question, stingrays and tower dumps uh, that, are, that are being done using pen registers that are more programmatic than just, I want to find this fugitive and I'm going to use a stingray to find him. Sir, your question. Yes. Uh, by any chance, are you working with a wonderful FBI agent, a rare, beautifully honest FBI agent, Frederick Whitehurst, PhD, who objected to, to fabrication of evidence in the FBI forensic laboratory in Maryland, and they fired him. But bef he had already pointed out a number of people and their fabrications. One of the first ones that had to be let go because they could not deny his fabrications 
was promptly hired by the state of Illinois to head up the brand new forensic, criminal forensic laboratory on, on Roosevelt Road here in Chicago. But my question to you, are, are you by any chance collaborating with or working with that wonderful Frederick Whitehurst? I don't, I don't know him. There are, um, one of the greatest people working in this area is a guy named Mike German, who's another FBI agent who left after, after he uh, whistle blew and, and came out. But the, the network is still growing, so I, thanks for giving me his name. Step right up to that microphone. Thank you. Um, Stingray and the FBI, so the, I'm not totally going into a new area, but uh, domestic law enforcement, um, the, the police departments have a lot of tools that are available now that weren't available. Uh, the FBI does. I just was reading Chicago crime stats r recently, and we're actually f solving less homicides than we were in the past. And I, I, I think, I mean, somehow people ought to be able to connect that we say we've got all this data for solving crimes, but then we're solving less crimes than we actually used to solve, which raises some issues about past law enforcement maybe too. No, I think it's another efficacy question. And I think one of the other things is at the local level, you're seeing a lot of funding going less to cops and more to giant military toys. Um, and the ones you can see, which are tanks, and the ones you can't see, which are stingrays. Um, so I think you know that's that's another reason why we're not having effective policing on the streets anymore. Forgive me if I missed this in the first part of the talk, but um, today they announced that the FBI is flying planes over U.S. citizens or cities, collecting data. So what does that mean? Can they literally listen into our conversations from p flights overhead? I'd like if you have any details about that. That would be helpful. Do you want to um, talk about what Stingrays can do? Well, I mean, uh, what it is is like spoofing your, your device so it'll talk to it so it gets to look at you and see you're there. And if you start talking, sure, they can pick it up. Yeah, it's, it, but they don't have to do that. They already have so many listing devices on the network that once your phone call enters the network, they can pick it up in any number of points. On that Fairview thing, those are, those are, that's for voice primarily, most of them. Uh, there are about 23 of them in the si inside the U.S. that are for uh, the digital network. The rest are for phones. What, what was really interesting about that is after some good activism, the FBI finally said, okay, maybe we'll make some drone rules for ourselves. And in the AP version of that article, they said, there are, there are a number of the rules on drones is you can't surveil for First Amendment protected activities. Uh, you can't use stingrays except to get location. You can't get content. And there were a set of rules that are attached to drones. And then the FBI said, oh, by the way, those rules for drones, they don't count for manned planes. So they don't count for those ones. <laughs> yeah, it's um, all, so it's all it's, a word game, really. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's going to be it's going to be interesting because I think I, I mean that was discovered. I mean, there, there was a guy in Minnesota who did actually a lot of the initial work on that, and and the thing about planes, especially in drones, to a lesser degree, is they're visible <laughs> in a way that a stingray in a protest is not necessarily visible. And the more that these visible kinds of surveillance get documented, especially by people, you know, looking out the window and tracking or, or tracking tail numbers, right, which is where that came from, I think it's going to be a lot harder for them to, to hide there. I mean, the other best part about that story, this is a good story, you guys should read it, is that, um, so the AP, you know, told the FBI they were going to publish the story, and the FBI said, please don't use, don't tell us, don't tell the fake names of the companies, of the cover companies we've used for these planes, because tax, we'll have to spend tax pair money to create new covers. <laughs> and, and the thing that was really ridiculous about that was that um, all of these planes, all these fake companies that run these planes to surveil us, um, they're all out of the same mailboxes, et cetera, place. So it's like they, they have no operational security and they're like, please don't make us actually get cover stories that work. I, I was going to add one more thing on the tracking. Uh, once they get the treasure map program running, uh, that's going to also get uh, added to that is going to be the facial recognition. Because if, uh, if you had to pick, use facial recognition on a large group of people, you get multiple uh, values and multiple uh, uh, possible matches. 
But if I have, uh, for example, I know where you are within a foot or two uh, at this time and then over at a foot or two at another time and so on, then I can go and say, okay, do we have video there? If we do, then let me look in there. And what face is in common at those times in those places? So then it can start compiling all your, all your uh, facial, re uh, facial uh, recognition. If you grow a beard, they can pick that up too and change their picture. So they can monitor that and use that uh, for everybody. So that's a way of uh, making other kinds of information and intelligence about people valuable. I, I, do you ever think that uh, the goal is panopticon, that, we are, that, that government just wants us to think we are being surveilled all the time, therefore we will not do the bad things that we are supposed to do? We're, we're being surveilled by the FBI, the Department of Justice, the, the, the NSA, the, everybody else, and, that's, and now we'll all obey a little better? Well, I, I mean, the, the whole objective, I think, is to move to a uh, move to a, um, a set, a set a, 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 an intelligence and law enforcement community that will be able to tell who's going to commit a crime in advance and then go arrest them before they do it. That was that was what was the movie? That was the. They actually do do that. They they do predictive policing in many yes. cities across the country already. Right. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, they want to do this on a grander scale. Okay. So they can do it worldwide. Uh, and um, what was the name of that movie that they had the Minority Report? Yeah, Minority Report. Well, that was only a few people. See, they want to do it with the entire population all the time. Sir. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, surveillance of Americans, and that's a, it's a good thing. Uh, but it seems to be almost a given that surveillance of non-Americans is OK. And I'm wondering what each of you three thinks. Is, is it okay to, to have suspicionless surveillance of non-Americans? Um, I, I personally oppose, see, I oppose the move of, um, we, we were at the beginning targeting uh, terrorist groups and dope smuggling groups. That means groups of people doing illegal or uh, terrorist or uh, you know, any kind of international crime activity. That's groups of people, not individuals. What they did is that, uh, with 9-11 was to switch from that focused attack on groups of people who were doing uh, bad things uh, to individuals. And it was individuals on the planet. They started with U.S. citizens first then just spread around the world. That change in focus went from targeted and disciplined look at data to bulk acquisition on everybody on the planet. That change changed everything. And it was basically the wrong thing to do universally most especially for U.S. citizens, because we have laws against that. And the Constitution requires probable cause any time you do that. So you're violating the funding, founding principles of this country when you start doing it against U.S. citizens. So, I mean, there's no law, we don't have any law that prevents us from doing it with foreigners. But, but there's still, the problem is when you do that on everybody in the planet that's foreign, that buries your analysts too. So you're making yourself dysfunctional by doing that. So for that reason alone, we shouldn't be doing it, let alone the laws and the Constitution. Well, and I think that's one of the problems with focusing on, US, uh, on Section 215, which is just domestic, when EO-12333 collects all of our international phone calls and the phone calls of the rest of the world. Um, and so it's, I think, a, 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 there, are, there are legal reasons why that happened, but I think it's also a shortcoming of the activism that has happened since Edward Snowden. Um, but I also think, I mean, I think bulk collection's wrong wherever it happens. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a terrible power structure to set up. But one of the ironies and one of the things that I think is going to finally rein in the NSA is the fact that up until Edward Snowden, the rest of the world believed we had used our hegemonic position on the global communications infrastructure, uh, had not abused it, right? Um, when the whole time we were sitting here in Maryland just sucking up the rest of the world's communications. And I think the rest of the world is beginning to push back. You're seeing that in Germany as they're being challenged for having, for having let their equivalent of NSA spy, uh, spy for Americans. But you're also beginning to see other countries uh, challenge the infrastructure of the internet. You're seeing other countries challenge the dominance of Microsoft and Google and Facebook. And that's not necessarily good for the American economy, but that's what's gonna convince 
this country to stop spying on the rest of the world when our the source of our power starts to fr starts to crumble because we have abused what people thought we were not abusing if that makes sense so i mean there's a very good human rights argument to say we shouldn't do it at all but there's also a very good realpolitik reason to say that's what's going to burn us in the butt um do you want to follow up? Well, you, what's your answer? <laughs> do, 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 do I think it's okay to, yeah. spend, uh, to, to spy on everybody else? No. I, I mean, I think we should treat people with a little more respect than that. I, I mean, we spy on all our allies so vigorously. That's uh, it's been so you know humiliating to 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 read about uh, you know Brazil and Germany and people. You know, I it's I don't think it's getting you much, and it's certainly. Um, earning you enmity and um, back and forth. It's, 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 uh, we should do it less. We should do it as little well, and, as possible. And one of, the, one of the things we're learning in the places we actually admit to being at war is, you know, we're killing Afghans, we're killing Iraqis that our dumb intelligence system claims to be terrorists or claims to be insurgents or claims to be opposed to the United States, and they turn out not to be. Um, because our dumb intelligence system isn't working, and therefore we end up killing completely innocent people and making more enemies. So, I mean, I think the fact that you potentially target anybody in Afghanistan or Iraq in turn leads to exacerbating these terrible wars that we're already in. Uh, may I ask a second question, or would you prefer one question per person? Um, give it to us quick. Okay, so the satirical newspaper, The Onion, Today's headline was frustrated NSA now forced to rely on mass surveillance programs that haven't come to light yet. So I'm wondering, does that sound about right? Is there more surveillance programs that we don't know about or more laws that, we, that they're relying on that we don't know about yet, so they're just going to go on and continue doing the same kind of stuff? Do we know everything? Do we, do, do, are there surveillance programs we still don't know about? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sir. I, I agree with, with the uh, first comment uh, that uh, the earlier question or comment that, uh, we, that uh, this whole program is, seems like a racket, that uh, the uh, collection, of, the creation of false threats, uh, the creation of fear, you know, the creation of war keeps the racket going, just as uh, General Smedley Butler wrote a, th a century ago, that war, war is a racket. And I would be optimistic that if we could get a state where there is no secrecy, then there would be no war. Uh, I'm wondering if, it's, if there's reason to hope that there will be more Edward Snowdens and, and no more uh, secrets, and the internet will help us publish, and we, there's more of us watching the security state than, than them watching us. Uh, well, I think we, we've already had at least one come out, to follow up to Edward Snowden, giving the list of those on the drone, drone kill list, uh, 1.2 million people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I call that program random slaughter because they do a double tap principle that means you go, you know, if you think you have the target, they don't even verify that it is the right target. Uh, then they, they do it by metadata, not by content, yeah. so you can't tell if you've got the right target. So they shoot the, that, that target and then they wait for people to come in to, to try to help. I mean, if somebody sees somebody bleeding on the ground, they generally would go over and try to do something, you know? Well, they wait till them, they, they come in, and then they kill them, too. Yeah. That's called a double tap. Uh, and that's their yeah. operating principle. Yeah. Yeah, that's random you know, slaughter. What kind of people do that, you know? It, it, a slaughter. It, yeah. it, we got to stop. I think not only will we see more Edward Snowden's, um, which is I, part of the point of Stand Up For Truth, is to, to make whistleblowers not so uh, isolated and not so villainized um, so that it may be easier for people in the future, so that so they won't so people won't be met with a gun as they get out of the shower as Bill was we're back in, in um, were thrown in prison but the other thing that I think is happening is I think things like the David Petraea sentence the hand slap for leaking leaking code word intelligence when other people were going to prison for 20-year terms I think that I think the, the credibility of the secrecy state is beginning to crumble, and that has as much an important effect as more Edward Snowden's. I think the two go in tandem. 
Ma'am. Yeah. Hi, I have a couple of ideas. Um, one, I have a theory that if the fairness doctrine was still in place, that was thrown out in the mid 80s, that required TV and broadcast to present both sides of an issue fairly, you know, um, that, you know, we should have a right to truth in the media and in history, you know, and there should be a public record, uh, and if there's a lie, it should be not allowed somehow. So, I, I mean, that's, I don't hear much talk about the fairness doctrine being put back in, uh, mainly, you know, Reagan threw it out. But another point I wanted to make was, I heard you talk about, you know, the Germans and the BND, um, and the research I've done is that Reinhard Gellin started the BND. The CIA brought him over from Nazi Germany, um, you know, with these thousand Nazis that came over in the CIA, and then they, Alan Dulles, put him in the German CIA and started. So they are essentially both our CIA and the German is an extension of of Carl Schmitt, the who was Hitler's jurist. So, you know, why are we surprised that this, you know, the, it looks like the Stasi. It is the Stasi, but I, it seems like there's no law against it. It's really frustrating that, I'm so glad to hear you at least speaking up honestly. And um, it seems, at times you wonder if the Congress doesn't even know what's going on. You know, there's, it's only whistleblowers, pieces of the truth come out. Oliver Stone's untold history is great, and I heard him say that he says there was a coup d'etat, essentially, you know, after World War II. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a military industrial state, and we're just living in it, so. <laughs> No, I, I, I agree that uh, the, the, the B and D, uh, that's why I say uh, you can't trust any intelligence agency you, you create. Any, no government can. So it's not just us, it's the, the Germans can't, nor can the French or the British. You can't, they can't trust them because they'll go do their own thing. They'll even spy on the, on the heads of their government just to see what they're thinking and what their, what their intentions are, if anything, toward their, toward their agency. They do that all the time. That was the, the, under Minaret, they were spying on Ch Senator Church. I mean, the reason they did that, because he was running the investigation of him, you know? So he was one of the primary targets on the Minaret program. And the same is true today, that today there's, they're, they're listening to uh, House and Senate members, judges on the Supreme Court, uh, generals and admirals on the, uh, on the um, Joint Chiefs of Staff, all of that. That's all going on even today. See, I think this, you know, Anthony Scalia and some of these are working with, they're protecting it. You know, they've kind of got their plants in each part of the, the political system. So, yeah. um, and then they play them off each other. That's kind of the law. It, it's called, what, uh, political theology. It, it's a twisted Machiavellian interpretation of the law that is behind all this. The, the Soviets and the KGB called that disinformatia and manipulatia, okay? <laughs> so this is exactly what our intelligence community is doing with our government. Um, to your point about the fairness doctrine, I don't think it's coming back. <laughs> Blame but, Reagan. But it is, um, uh, it is something, you, you want accountability. You want people who are not to be liars to be, you want them called onto the carpet or, and you want them not talking at you all the time, spreading lies. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to get us there, but it's, I, I, I think it's some kind of, uh, we got to shout them down or something. It's got to be a, like an internet, uh, yeah. uh, internet vote on your driver or something, your rating system or something. One of the problems with the two sides journalism, the way it works right now, is if the torture report comes out, then Michael Hayden and Jose Rodriguez, the torturers, get to present their view. And I think, you know, there's, there's a problem in the mindset of journalism on surveillance, they can find a right-wing supporter of surveillance and a left-wing supporter of surveillance. It's a bipartisan support, so um, you kind of need to break down those binaries and insist ultimately on some truth, uh, or, you know, Jose Rodriguez will continue to tell his torture lies. 
Mm. Okay, um, let's do, should we do one more question? How are we doing in time? Okay, right, we'll do a couple of questions. Okay, sir. All right, um, we'll try to get to everybody. Here, here we go, sir. As long as the word accountability was used, I'm going to start by asking the rhetorical question when you talked about Hayden being asked about torture and so on. Why wasn't Hayden being asked by a court of law, by a prosecutor? When is the last time that any of these people were, did a single day in jail for breaking FISA or any of the other laws you folks are trying to uh, strengthen, <clears throat> quote, unquote. Let me, let me answer. Who in Washington, D.C., or who among major players in the media are even calling for any prosecutions and vigorous to the point of bringing jail time for any of the people who've ever broke any of the kinds of laws we're talking about. It seems to me as though until such time as there are actual jail <clears throat> days served, you folks are, if I may, I, I hate to say it, spitting in the ocean. Yeah, uh, the last one who was actually uh, convicted or uh, suffered any case was Richard Nixon. Yeah. Okay, and the last, and, and, and I, blame, I blame all the stuff that's happening today on Jerry Ford because he pardoned him. But nobody, that, who's, that gave is, the president a get out of jail free card. The is next Rand president. Paul saying anything about jail time for any of these people? Bernie yeah. Sanders, any Actually, of them? Paul, I believe, has said that Clapper and Snowden should share, should, should share a cell together. Yeah. So I don't necessarily back that, but. Uh, people are calling for Clapper to see jail time, but Clapper lied. Well, They're not calling for people to go to jail for the illegal wiretapping and the torture. Well, but they doesn't that matter? They should be. They and should why be. are you guys spending a whole bunch of time trying to get the laws strengthened when what difference does it make what the law says? These guys are going to do their thing anyway until such time as the hammer actually comes down. I'll take that as a vote against impunity. Um, Ma'am, step right up. Um, I've got to take this on a, on a different track. I'd like to know um, to what extent the NSA technology and data is being handed over to private corporations and private security industries to monitor protesters like myself. Nobody's been talking about that. You want to know how much of the data the NSA collects gets to private companies? And um, also uh, police, local right. police forces right. working in conjunction with um, providing security for corporations right. Right. rather than protecting citizens. Right. One of the things that um, has happened since, as we pass these laws, Every time we pass a law fixing these things, so Protect America Act, FISA, America, FISA Amendments Act, and USA Freedom Act, they always change it such that rather than going in through the NSA, it goes in through the FBI. And the reason they're doing that is because the NSA actually has remarkably strict sharing rules. The FBI has nothing. Their job is to share down, and they say this very explicitly. They say FBI can share with city, state, locality fusion centers, which is where you get into the corporations, uh, JTTFs, tribes, and so on. And so one of the, th I mean, I love Edward Snowden. I'm glad he did what he did. But where the attention really needs to be is on the FBI, because the FBI is that crux that feeds the data out to the localities and I think really, really does get them in the hands of local cops who don't know what the heck they're doing, except they know they want to go knock heads at a protest. So you're right. It's a problem. The fusion centers in particular are a problem because they're, they're local corporations who are being deputized to be cops. Um, but, but the FBI is the nexus between the NSA data uh, and your local cop. And uh, is there any legal recourse? I, I feel like increasingly um, judges act on their gut versus acting on the law. And, and so it, it seems like a total sham. I think it depends on the judge you get. 
And, that's and what one I've thing been that's saying. Really, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that's really important and really useful on uh, local judges is to make sure um, the techniques get out. I mean, one of the reasons we know increasingly about stingrays is because everyone around the country is looking, and there are lots of activists, some of them in this room, who are trying to suss it out. Um, but there are lots of other technologies that judges, frankly, don't, aren't equipped to understand. Um, and so that information sharing needs to happen for that kind of thing, um, and the information sharing for what happens to local to local activists. I think um, some of that has happened in Chicago recently with the Guardian, but not enough. Thank you. Okay. Hi. I tend to agree uh, like with you ones. that we've already entered the Opticon age, and we've not only entered it, we have purchased it through all of our computers and our cell phones and our iPhones so they can watch us better. So we've actually been talked into buying all these monitors for ourselves. And I think actually, you know, when it comes down to it, all this intelligence has been gathered uh, so that they can take it and look at one person if they want to and zero down in a person and find out what they've done wrong, according to them, what they don't like what they've done like a whistleblower. So they have all these records already that they can zero into. Uh, I've or, I belong to a number of uh, protest groups, and they're always broken up by people who come in and start creating chaos. And I really feel it's part of your training people you were mentioning earlier, who've been trained by NASA uh, and NSA to go into groups and make them dissolve and give up on whatever they're trying to do. But my real question in this whole thing is, where is our media? Why aren't they out there talking about it? Why are they putting this ugly spin on the article you were just talking about on the New York Times? Why are they putting this anti-Fourth Amendment spin on it? Well, why isn't our media jumping up and down and saying, hey, this is our fourth amendment we're giving up, folks. Do we want to do this? What? What do you guys have? So where, where's the media? I, you yep. know. I are you, without the media, you guys can talk all year, and we can try to protest and be broken up next year, and they can go dig out those records and find something horrible about that protester if they possibly can, and, and harass them, you know, without having everyone sort of hearing about this or paying attention to it, and not a watered-down version that this is really okay, wrong. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, um, yeah, do you, does anybody want to respond there? Well, I think we're going to just kind of go lightning through everybody in line right now and hear them out and hear what their question is real quick, and then we'll have uh, some final responses. We'll just kind of uh, take notes. Okay? Thanks very much. Sorry. Um, sir. So we keep on hearing about uh, everything that people are doing and what's happening. What can people do who may not know in this room or outside? What can they do to shut it all down and stop it and prevent this stuff from continuing? Because it seems like people are just kind of lax about it and thinking that somebody else is going to take care of it. So who do you suggest to organize with and how to get started and uh, what should people do? Um, next question. Come on up. I was just wondering if you would comment what you expect the fate of Edward Snowden and other whistleblowers like him will ultimately be. Um, sir. Edward Snowden wasn't a top-ranking NSA official, and yet he had this tremendous access. He worked for a private corpor a contracting corporation, which uh, suggest a tremendous potential for abuse, and is there any oversight of that, and what do you see of that situation? Um, and, sir? Yes, yeah, so I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I have mixed feelings and opinions about it. I, I think Edward Snowden embarrassed our uh, fine country in some ways, though I think to your earlier point about arrogance, it may have been necessary to address that arrogance. I love your earlier points about competence or lack thereof. Um, I think one of my primary concerns, though, is, you know, a lot of this information that's been leaked now is available to enemy nation states, right? And is that a threat to us? Is that a problem? 
Do you want to work backwards or? I'm going to start with the oversight one because it's quick and easy. Um, the, the NSA has oversight for analytical positions. They, they get audited, but tech positions do not. Uh, SIGDEV, which is the researchers, do, don't get audited. And so the answer is for people like Edward Snowden or people who are doing research on the cutting edge of this stuff, that is where they could get away with murder and we wouldn't know. <laughs> One of the most recent violations of the phone dragnet program involved the researchers leaving 3,000 files of some varying size on a server that they were playing with and no one knows. And before they could find out what they were doing with that data, they destroyed it. So the answer is no, not enough oversight. Uh, 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 back in 1991-92, we proposed a, a program we called Well Grounded to go at the entire worldwide network of NSA and monitor everybody on it and what they were doing every minute of every day. <clears throat> and we were going to do that by analyzing the network logs. So uh, uh, technically, we could do that and, and uh, be able to pick out what people were doing with something in the order of 20 to 40 milliseconds. After they did it, we would know what they were doing and have software to diagnose it. Uh, we proposed that inside NSA. Our proposal lasted one month and a half. We had two groups that were opposing it. One were all the analysts saying, don't spy on me. I'll do my job. You leave me alone. Okay? These are the guys looking at you. Okay? Right? Now, and the other group was the more important one. That was the managers that, that said, uh, you mean you could tell all the money I move around on different programs and how, what, how, how productive programs are, return on investment, all that? Yeah, sure. And, and, and you mean Congress could come in and ask for that and look at that? I said, yeah, they could do that. You're not doing it. So that's, that's why we got killed. On the question of what people learn from Snowden, what, what our adversaries learn, learn from Snowden's releases, I, I, I suspect that one of the things the intelligence community is most pissed about is that people learned that they were getting Skype because international phone calls, something like 34% of the international phone calls coming to the United States are on Skype. Uh, and people thought that that was inaccessible, and in fact it is. So that's one, that's one tool, right, that people figured out that they're not going to make uh, sensitive calls with Skype anymore. But when you think about it, um, another one of the really damaging leaks, aside from the whole Stuxnet leak, which is kind of self-leaking and continues to self-leak, but one of the most damaging leaks in recent years was the story about uh, the Air Force breaking a kind of complex encrypted chat system the AQAP had, uh, and it, they broke it up. That wasn't a Snowden leak. And the reason I raise that is because damaging leaks that reveal what are, what, I mean, and that, I, I almost guarantee you, was more specifically damaging because it was the high-level AQAP terrorists who actually might do us damage rather than people trying to have sensitive conversations on Skype. Um, those leaks happen all the time. So while it is probably true that people learn stuff from Edward Snowden that will make it harder to find them, it is also true that self-interested bureaucrats leak probably more sensitive information on a daily basis that lets specific terrorists or speci specific adversaries know precisely what's going on. Yeah, like for example, the phone number, the, the Intermarsat number for Osama bin Laden, that was leaked. I mean, that, and that dried up uh, r fairly quickly after 1998. So that was a total loss at that point. So that, that was really damaging. The, the rest of it that was released, everybody in, in the world in the intelligence business knew we were doing that because they do it too, right? So they just don't have the capacity and capability resources to do it to the scale that we do, that's all. So they didn't learn anything. I mean, they, they already knew that. There was a question in there about Edward Snowden's fate and um, what, what's going to happen to him. I mean, it's been uh, for a couple of years that the tune has changed for that guy in a couple of years, and yep. kind of almost remarkably. That they were, he's the most vilified person on earth, and now he is. Right. Um, <clears throat> polls are with him. Uh, you know, the, the politicians seem to be yeah, on yeah, his side. Parts of the uh, USA Freedom Act debate is that every single member of the Senate Intelligence Committee insists on calling him Eric Snowden. <laughs> so that guy, Eric Snowden, he's probably going to prison, unfortunately <laughs> for him. But Edward Snowden, they don't know who he is. Uh, um, and finally, the, 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 final, uh, the final question, what, what can we all do to shut it down? Uh, the, that was the... Uh, uh, well, the, I, I, in, in my mind, that means you have to speak up, write your senators, write your representatives. When they come to you for a town meeting, get up and 
put, the, put it to them and say, Why are you do, what are you doing to stop the spying on U.S. citizens, a violation of the first, fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments of the Constitution? Why don't you just scrap the Constitution? If you don't want to do that, then, then don't include any, any oath to protect and defend the Constitution in, any, in any, uh, any office you take because you're not doing it. On, the, on the, Ed, the fate of the Edward Snowden question, and, and obviously he's target number one, so I can't tell you what's going to happen to him, and to some degree a lot of it depends on Vladimir Putin, which is not a position I'd like to be in if I were Edward Snowden. But, um, but uh, something interesting happened this year, which is that um, a guy named Jeffrey Sterling was found guilty for being a source for James Rison on another intelligence story, and the government said, send him to prison for 30 years. And in between the time he was found guilty and the time he was sentenced, David Petraeus got a hand slap for doing virtually the same thing. And rather than, and, and the judge in the Sterling case was, is, is one of CIA's favorite judges, so she's no pushover. Um, rather than sentencing him to 30 years, she sentenced him to 42 months, which is a lot. but. The judges are beginning to get more skeptical because of this disparate treatment of official leakers like David Petraeus and people like Edward Snowden and Jeffrey Sterling and uh, Chelsea Manning and so on and so forth. And I think that's one of the reasons why we need to talk about the importance of whistleblowers because when it becomes clear that Jeffrey Sterling did his country a service and David Petraeus was self-serving, trying to fluff his own ego, it becomes a lot harder to send Jeffrey Sterling for, to prison when, when David Petraeus isn't going. Marcy Wheeler, Bill Binney, thanks a lot for everything.